Carlo Falava, good afternoon, uh, kia ora. Can I, can I first uh, say thank you very much uh, to Minister Megan Woods for extending the invitation for me to join you in this very significant conversation uh, that you are holding here in the Taranaki. Can I also acknowledge and thank the welcome from the Taranaki iwi. Um, I wish to acknowledge um, the tangata whenua. And when we talk about the whenua, then that speaks to the center of what we are all here today. Uh, because we're talking about our collective whenua and the impacts of climate change. Uh, this invitation to come to this meeting has also given me the opportunity as a minister from Samoa to also meet with some of my counterparts uh, in the New Zealand government. And um, it has been a, a very useful uh, visit. I was able to uh, discuss with Minister Shaw, uh, who will be addressing the summit later on. Uh, mostly around the legislative infrastructure that is warranted um, for the work that we're here to talk about and to undertake. Uh, and of course, um, it was also an opportunity to talk with your Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, to talk about the New Zealand ODA, the Overseas Development Assistance Program of all you New Zealand taxpayers contribute to, um, to assist, amongst many others, your neighbors in the Pacific. Um, I was very interested, uh, not only when I got the invitation, but I also got given uh, the documentation about the purpose and objectives of the summit. And it's quite funny, you know how it is when people are, other people are having conversations and you're sitting nearby, and there's an element of uh, eavesdropping. So I'm really happy I got an official invitation um, to come and listen to the conversation here. I would have to say that, you know, I'm a politician. Um, the MC kindly introduced me as the Deputy Prime Minister of Samoa, but I'm also the Minister for Environment and natural resources. And of course, uh, those key uh, elements are at the center of the climate change uh, work and agenda. So I'm very happy uh, to have been invited to come. I will talk a little bit about um, our renewable energies because that's our main um, mitigation efforts, not only for Samoa, um, but uh, for the Pacific region. But I just wanted to talk about the politics, the geopolitics um, that surround uh, these issues. And you will, of course, be aware that the Pacific Islands were at the forefront of advocating for the 1.5 degree um, target as opposed to the two degrees. And I'm not going to give you the talk about you know, the, the difference between those degrees because you know, um, but this was one thing that the Pacific Islands um, were able to agree upon, advocate for, and we are so thrilled that the New Zealand government um, has shifted its policy, it's now declared its targets, and for us, uh, from the neighborhood, so to speak, um, this is a very significant development um, that we have one of the uh, leader countries within our region take that step. We just have to persuade the fellows in the West of us that that's also a, a good direction for them to go and to join the 
the Pacific Coalition in its advocacy and its work towards climate change. When I was uh, talking with um, Minister Shaw, he said to me, are there other ways that New Zealand um, can better work with the Pacific countries? Now, Samoa, uh, we were, if you didn't know, we were previously administered by the New Zealand government up until 1962 when we became independent. And we are the only country that New Zealand has a treaty of friendship with. Um, so I was very interested with the comments from the Iwi uh, here today um, when they talk about that partnership in a treaty sense. Treaties, uh, other instruments of the like, um, you know, they are instruments by which we've evolved or developed uh, throughout the years. And, you know, we can work treaties um, in the strictest constitutional sense, but I think, um, let me speak about the Samoan and New Zealand Treaty of Friendship. We should really look to what was the spirit um, of that treaty. Um, and friendship, if that is the basis um, of a relationship, is that we look out for each other, and we tell each other the truth. Um, uh, just coming back to uh, the geopolitics thing, when I was having this discussion with Minister Shaw and also Deputy Prime Minister Winston Peters, is that there are so many distractions for us with this work of climate change, and that is a focus that we have in the Pacific, and obviously it's becoming a focus for you in New Zealand, as you're transitioning your economy, uh, because the geopolitical distractions that are there really do take us away from the important work. And sometimes it may also take up more space and more time um, than we should be spending on it. For us in the Pacific, I have the uh, Prime Minister of the Cook Islands here, you know, the, the whole China-Taiwan thing has become, you know, uh, such a, a heated uh, issue within the Pacific Islands that it's making it difficult for us to move forward. And it's not because of our interests, but it's because of the interests of other people. And what, if there's a lesson to be learnt <coughs> from that, we in the Pacific have to be able to stand up and say, you know, we have our relationships. If you have a problem with each other, that's your problem. You know, let's get on with what we're supposed to be getting on with. But for small countries, geopolitical situations and conditions makes our lives so much difficult than it already is. Um, and the other, you know, one sort of political type comment I want to make is, you know, we're all often invited uh, to go to um, uh, forums like this, and they say to us, well, what can you tell us about what we, what we should be doing? Well, to be quite frank, and I think this is where con friendly conversations are at, the experience of the Pacific is that we don't actually tell anyone what to do. Our experience has been we have to navigate our way through the stakes that other people have put on the ground, and we accept that. We accept it as our lot. What we fall back on is multilateralism. We cling strongly to UN and the conventions that are there because for small island states, therein lies a level of security that we would expect as, um, you know, members of the, of the human race. So I thought, you know, making a contribution to the conversation that you're having here 
it can all be very much looking in, what our problems are, but it's also being aware of what is around us and the impacts that we do that have on other peoples, whether they be in New Zealand, in our region of the Pacific, um, and the world. But I do want to uh, acknowledge in this su summit um, and say congratulations to this New Zealand administration for what is considered a very brave and courageous move to set targets and to begin to have conversations, which has been expressed here today, are uh, inclusive conversations. That inclusiveness has been challenged, I hear this morning, uh, the iwi saying, no, we haven't really been consulted, we've been presented. Quite often for small countries, that's also our lot, when we are supposedly being consulted. So I think we need to rethink when we're really talking about inclusiveness, what that looks like, what that means, and mind shifts that actually need to happen. So can I, my one last comment on governance and leadership, talking about brave and courageous leadership, um, I think one of the um, interesting documentations more recently around leadership and bravery and courage, and they say it's about rumbling with your vulnerabilities, rumbling with your vulnerabilities, showing your soft belly. And that's a real measure, I think, of people willing to step in to have that conversation and to share that vulnerability with their communities and partners in development. So coming back to the main um, subject of our forum, uh, the focus for Samoa um, and the Pacific is on renewable energy. That's our main commitment to the Climate Change Convention. Uh, of course, I don't need to explain to you because New Zealand is far ahead in the renewable energies, but for us, the high dependence on uh, fuel uh, has been such that most of our um, money has been taken up uh, by the dependence on, on fuel. So the move for us to renewable energy um, is not only climatically the thing to do, but it is a saving on very limited uh, resources that we have. Um, and of course, connected to um, energy, um, that we're looking at not only, and the target that we have set in Samoa is to be 100% uh, renewable energy for the electricity sector. Um, we are then looking to the transport sector uh, because that is another a significant area that we need to address, uh, mostly for general use uh, vehicles, moving on to commercial and mostly public transport. So, you know, these are the things that um, we need to plan for. Small countries um, have uh, very limited resources. We have to be a lot more strategic uh, about how we use our resources. Um, almost, uh, it's an almost automatic response that we have to be a lot more integrated in our approaches to anything, including climate change, because we have to utilize that very limited resource, whether it be financial or, you know, the more significant one, which is our human resource. And, you know, that is uh, the challenge for the Pacific, the limited resources that we have. Um, and, you know, it's one thing to be doing our work in mitigation and adaptation, um, but more often than not, 
we're having to do what everyone else in the world is doing, which is responding to natural disasters, which are happening more frequently and at much uh, more de de devastating uh, rates. So um, we've had some, uh, part of my brief is to talk about some of the challenges and some of the opportunities. So our challenges, you know, is the, the smallness, the limited resources we have, uh, but the opportunities we, we have, uh, especially in the energy sector, is that more often and not in the small Pacific countries, um, the government or government agency is the sole provider of energy or electricity. You know, I think one of the opportunities arising out of the work in climate change and renewables is that we can have a lot more actors uh, within this particular sector um, and not necessarily just the government uh, being the sole provider. And of course, um, the best outcome that we look for, that we all look for, is that we're having these um, energy uh, at much cheaper rates than we're facing at the moment. I'm advised by Minister Woods that um, wind energy is uh, the cheaper option and, um, and the government, as an example here, uh, have also particular tax incentives that can encourage that. So one of the useful things about us all getting together uh, for uh, these forums is how much we can learn off each other. Um, there's one thing I was wondering whether I might um, just brush lightly over and not be impolite as an invited guest to your conversation, but it struck me as very interesting that this is an economic transition, as many other transitions have been. You know, sometimes uh, the background changes, but it's still the same, same thing. What is our economy based on? And if we're making these transitions, to make it really work, does the basis of our economies have to change? I'm sort of hearing it peripherally in some of the earlier conversations. But I think for all of us, if we're talking about transitions, trust transitions premised upon our respective economies, then I think the conversation needs to be a lot deeper. Because if our economies are premised on profit, then I don't think anything is going to seriously change. <coughs> I had a very interesting trip to New Plymouth. Um, I had to fly from Wellington to Auckland to come down here. But it gave me the opportunity to sit next to a gentleman. And as you do when you are on the airplane, you introduce each other and sort of say, oh, why are you going to New Plymouth? Oh, going to the Just Transition Summit. And both of us were going. Um, Peter, are you here? Bryant? I think he's in the next session. Oh, there you are. And he's the business guy. <laughs> so we were having this interesting conversation, you know, about how businesses need to adjust, how we all need to adjust. So, and, and he said, well, you know, one th good thing about capitalism is that it usually finds a way. And the only other thing I've heard that sort of expression come is with water, you know, water will always find a way. But the thing is, usually in our experience, 
when the water usually finds a way, it's about flooding. <laughs> so I think, you know, using the business analogy, um, that might be some of the things we need to think about. The controls of that flow. Is it going to be a small flow? Who controls the flow? Where does the flow go? And, and so forth. So, coming back to, to the Pacific, um, I've talked about the renewable energies as the prioritized mitigation uh, commitment of the Pacific. But I would have to be quite honest with you and say that most of the Pacific is now focusing on adaptation. Because the impacts of climate change is such upon us in the Pacific Islands that we do our bit to mitigate. I mean, we don't emit that much or it's very negligible. Um, so quite frankly, we're about adaptation. And I think we share the message that I'm hearing around the room in that, you know, all the different participating partners here, government, business, communities, iwi, um, I think we all play a particular role at particular levels, you know, and in different places. And it was quite interesting that polling exercise that we had, the first one, uh, the first one was about local, right? I mean, it was about rural communities, but it just spoke to the local situation and how people respond. And then the second question um, was about the alignment of government in that they can actually continue from one government to another government given that you have three-year cycles, right? Three-year cycle? We have five-year cycles uh, where I come from. But if there's one last thing I would like to uh, share with the summit is about partnership. It's very important partnership. We had a big SIDS conference in Samoa a few years back, and the whole concept of partnering for development um, you know, was the main flag of that meeting. But following uh, that SIDS meeting and the development of the Samoa pathway, which is the roadmap or the blueprint for on, on how we uh, progress as small island developing states. The experience for us in Samoa about this partnering thing is that um, when people come together and it doesn't work out, um, it's usually being because there were assumptions that people came in with. Um, there was no clarity around what each party brought to the table. And for sure, there was no uh, clarity around the, the benefits uh, accruing from that particular partnership. Where it has been successful is where there was clarity in all those uh, areas. And more importantly, from a government you know, person, um, was when we had true investor interests from the private sector. You know, these were committed uh, private sector individuals, private sector organizations. Um, they weren't just there to look for a quick buck, but they wanted to assist to reach the mutual goals of the parties sitting at the table. How am I doing for time? Okay. He tells me I'm out of time. So thank you very much uh, for the invitation. I hope I haven't been too rude as an invited observer to your conversation, but sincerely, we wanted to make a contribution uh, as you move forward in your journey in New Zealand. Pass back.
Thank you very much for your insights and your observations. You certainly weren't rude, and I think one of the key uh, challenges in your address was for us to see this not just as an economic transition, but a social one, uh, and one that is about people. Um, so we appreciate you making the trip here. I welcome the Honourable Henry Puna. To the Honourable Prime Minister of New Zealand, the Right Honourable Jacinda Ardern. To the Deputy Prime Minister of Samoa, the Honourable Fiame Mata'afa, Cabinet Ministers of the New Zealand Government, Honourable Dr. Megan Woods, Honourable James Shaw, Honourable Grant Robertson. To the Tangata Whenua, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I bring you warm greetings from the government and the people of the Cook Islands. Kia ora ana, tato kato toa, te mato te tua. To the Tangata Whenua, can I say, me taki maata no te roa, maana ana, tako tui oro mai ke mato e nukuni. I also would like to thank the Honourable Dr. Megan Woods for the kind invitation and the opportunity to participate in this national conversation about shaping New Zealand's transition pathway. I must say that I have a soft spot for Taranaki and for New Plymouth in particular, having spent the final two years of my secondary education at New Plymouth Boys High School. Kia ora. Some old boys from New Plymouth Boys High? Congratulations to us for winning our rugby game yesterday. <laughs> I saw that on TV when I checked into the hotel. So, you know, for me, this is a bit like a homecoming after so many years. Please don't ask me how long ago I was here. I also would like to commend the New Zealand government for this excellent initiative of bringing together a broad range of stakeholders to have this important conversation on how New Zealand will adapt and address the challenges that it faces to give New Zealanders the future they want and they deserve. If I may share this truth with you, what New Zealand is doing will not only impact on New Zealand, but also on your Pacific neighbors, and in fact, on the entire world. You are definitely showing leadership to the rest of the world by recognizing that the business as usual approach has never worked, is not working, and will not work. As your Pacific neighbor and special friend, I sincerely congratulate New Zealand. This country's aspiration to be a zero carbon emissions economy is definitely something to celebrate for our small island states who have for many decades called for action on climate change. I recall in 2014, the UN envoy for climate change, Mary Robinson, stated that climate change is a development issue. It is a financial issue. It is a moral issue. It is a political issue. And it is all of those issues. Essentially, it is an issue of people and about people. In this connection, I am reminded of the Maori proverb, Ea te mea nui o te aone. He tangata, he tangata, he tangata. It is people, people, and people. For my people in the Cook Islands, living, living meaningful lives in our low-lying atolls, especially in the Northern Group, will not be possible in the future if global attitudes and behaviors do not change. As land masses condenses with the rising tide, where we decide to build our homes will have to change. Where we decide to grow our crops must change, as traditional planting grounds are inundated by the sea. 
where we decide to bury our loved ones must also change. In fact, where we decide to conduct and build businesses must change to take into consideration the threat of more intense storms, floods, droughts, and cyclones. And as the oceans and seas acidification intensifies, our major food supply sources must also change. Ladies and gentlemen, it is already changing. In fact, our entire natural world is changing. Flora and fauna no longer follow the traditionally accepted norms or patterns. For us living on small islands, we have no choice but to adapt, to change, to undergo transition. The sad reality is that small island states have less room to maneuver. This is our reality. Our islands are already feeling the impacts of climate change. But while we must continue to remind the world of our vulnerability to the adverse impacts of climate change, we are also demonstrating that we are leaders in the world in taking action. We have already begun this process of change, this process of transformation, because the truth is we have no other option. I don't like being labeled a victim. I'd like to be a leader. Before I became prime minister, I was living on Manihiki in the Northern Cook Islands. Electricity on Manihiki was only available for a certain number of hours, normally from 6 a.m. to 12 noon and from 6 p.m. to midnight. This was at the best of times because you could be certain that sometimes diesel would run out either because of shipping problems or hurricane season or that the island administration could not afford the diesel. I came to realize that there needed to be a better way to guarantee reliable electricity supply. And I came to the conclusion that there was only one option, renewable energy. The truth is we had a significant supply of sunlight and that we made, it made sense for us to harness this to provide for our energy needs. Therefore, when I entered the national elections in 2010, I made the deliberate decision for the policy stance that by 2015, we would have 50% of our islands powered by renewable energy and 100% by next year. You know, we're already 80% of the way there. <laughs> ah, here's the most important part. We couldn't have done it without New Zealand's help. So thank you, New Zealand government, and thank you, New Zealand taxpayers. The generous support from New Zealand has been fundamental in allowing us to meet our ambitions of electricity, as I just outlined before. And this is deeply appreciated. Thank you very much. We have, since 2015, transformed the electricity supply of four other islands in the Southern Group to solar energy. From a blend of grant funds from Japan, the European Union, and our own borrowings from the Asian Development Bank. Our main island of Rarotonga, the last one to be yet converted, now has 16% of its electricity provided by grid tide net metering, gross metering and independent power agreements between households, the private sector and the power utility. Our greatest challenge in Rarotonga is storage. This month, we anticipate the completion of installation of a one megawatt battery storage located at the airport. For some of you who've been to Rotonga, you would have seen those plants at the airport just before the plane is parked when you pull in. And by the end of this year, 
we hope to complete an additional one megawatt battery storage and two megawatt of load shifting capability installations. This will enable many more households and private sector investment in renewable energy. We're currently implementing the first phase of energy rollout on the island of Aitutaki. We have been joined in this venture by a new partner near Tero from the United States. Phase one is scheduled for completion in a couple of weeks and it will be commissioned as well. We acknowledge that in the entire scene of things, the Cook Islands carbon emissions are negligible. However, we believe that every little bit of carbon emissions reduction counts and we have to do our part. While we fully support the need for international recognition to be given of the special needs and vulnerability of our islands as small island states, hey, we also think of ourselves as large ocean island states. Our Pacific Ocean, the largest ocean on Earth, plays a key role in regulating global climate. Amongst its other significant features of sustaining and connecting all of us in the region. The Cook Islands in 2017 passed the Marae Moana Act, legally designating our entire EEZ of almost 2 million square kilometers as a marine park. We believe that not only is this critical for enhanced management of our marine resources, but that our conversation and management efforts will also contribute to the common good of the whole of mankind. In March this year, we held our very first Climate Change Roundtable in Rarotonga. I thank the New Zealand Government and the Honourable Minister Opito William Sio for actively participating at this important dialogue. This roundtable provided us with the opportunity to discuss with partners our mitigation aspirations for a paradigm shift to low emission development and to build our community's resilience to the impacts of climate change with appropriate adaptation actions. Ladies and gentlemen, we are committed to a development voyage that is green and blue and in harmony with our environment and our culture. The destination on this voyage do not only include renewable energy and marine management, but also transformation in waste management, ecotourism, infrastructure development, climate resilient agriculture, and so forth. Like you, we are transitioning. We have been having our conversations about how economy must change, how we must manage change to ensure that we maintain environmental integrity and our cultural values, and how we should not leave anybody behind on this important journey. Although we have the relevant plans and strategies in place, if we are going to adapt to current challenges and those of the future, we have to ensure that we are dynamic and that we are nimble. We have no doubt that we will learn many lessons along that journey. Therefore, as you shape your transition to a zero carbon emissions pathway, I wish you all the very best. You, New Zealand, will be leading the way for larger countries to follow. I can guarantee you that the rest of your Pacific family will be following your progress very closely and we will all be cheering you on. All the best, New Zealand. Kia ora and thank you for being part of this important conversation. Thank you.